Hi, I'm Graham from Second Era of Moles, and if you've clicked on this video accidentally, 90 seconds is all I ever ask. Welcome back to another week that was on Pokemon Masters X. This was the fourth week in Unova for our Champion Stadium. This week we've also had Trials on the Isle, you've had the Legendary Arena ongoing for Tornadus, there's been the Time Trial event come along this week, and the Battle Villa has opened up again, not to mention the Egg events, so there's lots of events going on. Look at that one! Wow, what about that one? So let's start off with the Champion Stadium. So for round one this week, your condition was you got a sync move countdown, so you start off at five to get to your sync move, rather than nine. I chose to go up against Marshall this week because he was weak to flying types. For most of the battles that I took on this week, the optional parameters revolve around strength. This is because they kind of lined up very well with the sort of sync nukers and the ones that have powerful moves that hit all opponents to them. So it was all about doing that damage quickly and getting in and taking out the other team before they could take me out. So for this first battle, I went in with a team of Pidgeot, Elisa and Rotom and Torterra. I went with Pidgeot because I have blue at 6x for this one, which means the sync mood hits all three of them. Rotom's in there for X special attack and breathtaking. One of the additional effects of breathtaking other than the sync move countdown is it gives a boost to accuracy and that plays well with the grid I have for Pidgeot. One of the nodes I've chosen is that the higher its accuracy, the more damage it does. Torterra is in there for its attack siphon and for its X defense. Obviously Marshall brings in fighting types so they're mostly likely to be doing physical damage. The attack siphon didn't do as much this week as I was hoping for and that's because after its sync move Sork is mainly going to be using close combat which is going to hit very hard. In fact the first time I tried it Torterra got one-shotted by it. I didn't even get to use um, good as new. The second time around I was I was more prepared and it hit me at a slightly different time in a slightly different phase so I was able to use it having just like a tiny little bit of health left but yeah be aware of close combat. So for this battle bar usage could be a bit of an issue none of the sync pairs have any way of boosting their own speed so they're all stuck at where they started so you're going to be using Hurricane a lot with Blue and Pidgeot and that's a three bar move. Rotom has its one bar Thundershock so that helps but you don't want to be using Seed Bomb on this one. I know I've talked in the past about how impressed I've been but this week it was a bit of a damp squib and I think that's partly because it, the attack on Torterra wasn't raised enough, the defense wasn't lowered enough and it's also not weak to grass type moves so yeah Hurricane is the way to go. But hopefully you get a few move point refreshes on X Special Attack, on Breathtaking, on X Defense and you can keep using those even if you don't need to use them. With this one it's a bit of a race to see if you can take out the enemy team before they get to the second sync move because you're going to survive the first one, probably not going to survive the second one but it's like can I get enough hurricanes in, can I get enough sync moves in, can I output that damage quickly enough that I'm going to be in and I'm going to be out. So for round two this week your condition was don't let any of your sync pairs faint. I chose to go up against Shauntal for this one and I took in a team of Blastoise, Palosand and Garchomp. Again I went with the lots of strength parameters for this one on my second try I failed the first time I remembered to switch out the physical attack reduction for a special attack redu reduction. Obviously Garchomp is a physical attacker and I was hobbling myself unnecessarily there. Now for this one you're going to be tempted to set Sandstorm straight away. For my money you don't really need to. Uh, I didn't have Blastoise change its lucky skill to Sand Shelter so it was taking sand damage every time and you can raise Garchomp's attack for the first few moves and it's not going to be sinking first anyway so you don't need it there when the sink move comes because Blastoise is going to be sinking first to get the team endurance and because you only get two goes of it you want to save it for a bit later so you can get the effects of 
the second train to move, but also get the sync move in there. So what you're going to be doing, obviously, raising Garchomp's attack with X attack. Aceron is going to be doing Astonish, maybe an X defense in there if you if you feel like it. Blastoise is going to be doing X defense all. Maybe even use some attacking moves if you if you really feel like it. Then Blastoise sinks for the endurance. After that, you're going to be setting Sandstorm. You're going to be raising Garchomp's speed and crit hit rate. And then after that, it's all about using Earthquake, Sync Moves, Astonish. I would save to the top for after you've used your first Sync Move, because up until then, no one's really using the bar, and then after that, everyone's going to be using it, so you don't really want to waste one when you don't need to, because it's going to expire before it really comes in handy. Watch out for Hypnosis. The two Gengars are going to try and hypnotize you and send you to sleep. That happened to me during like the second phase between the first and second sync move. It put Blastoise to sleep and I was a bit like, ooh, but luckily I was at a point where I only had four more moves, so I had a two and a two and I was onto the sync move. Now one of Acerola's trainer moves is over here. You want to be really careful with the timing of this one. If you use it at the right time, you're taking some of the pressure off of Blastoise, you're getting some healing going and it's all good. If you use it at the wrong time, Acerola is going to get hit with a powerful attack and that's your flinch setter down for the count. So I would recommend using it ooh, maybe two moves before the enemy's sync move because the last one before the sync move is always going to be raising one of their stats and on this one the move after the sync move is going to be setting sunny day so at once you're taking a sync move and one attack and then it's back to Blastoise. So I've talked in previous weeks about the enemy setting sunny day and then using heat wave and basically wiping me out. This week if you're following this strategy you have a way to counteract that you see that they've got sunny day set in there your next move after that should be sandstorm because that's going to overwrite it and you use it for healing sands for Ace roller and it powers up Garchomp's moves. As I said I didn't have sand shelter on Blastoise so after a while I just gave up attacking with Blastoise because the damage he was doing was very little and he was taking damage himself and really I wanted the damage he was taking to be from tanking hits rather than from sand damage. But it seemed to work out pretty well and I took out the last Pokemon just before they got their second sync move. For round three, this is a condition we haven't had in this region's Champions Stadium yet, and it's the effects that lower the enemy's stats are much more effective. So this is the only one that I didn't choose a strength-based set of parameters for, and I chose to go up against Caitlyn, and I took in a team of Koga, Janine, and Misty. Now you've probably seen this team before, so you know what's coming. It's a poison store strategy. So Koga sets poison, Janine does Venom Drench, Mesty does uh, healing and evasiveness. The reason I went in for this team is because Venom Drench lowers attack, special attack and speed, and it's gonna lower all of those a lot more. So whatever the enemy's choosing to attack with, it's gonna become less and less effective as the battle goes on. So because of the condition for this round, the one parameter you don't want to choose is no stat reduction. Obviously if you're basing a your strategy around lowering the enemy stats, you don't want that condition in there to take all of that away. I may or may not have gone into a battle or two forgetting that that was the condition, so learn from my mistakes. I originally went into this one with a kind of dodging team, so I went in with Koga, Heliolisk and Mew. I thought that Heliolisk would use Mud Slap, lower the attack as much as it can, the other three can all boost their own evasiveness, but oh, evasiveness in this game is just so difficult to rely on, it's like, right, I'm gonna get my evasiveness here, their accuracy is zero, my evasiveness is as high as it can go, and it's like the enemy is like, hmm, yeah, I see that, but got ya, got ya, got ya, got ya, every single time, so I abandoned that strategy after a couple because I just wasn't making any headway. I came back for a second run though, and I changed the order to 
putting Xerneas in there instead of Koga, making them the tank to take all of the hits. Mew in the middle, Heliolisk uh, second, and that worked out a lot, lot better because Xerneas can almost sustain itself through pretty much any damage. Heliolisk can use Parabolic Charge to restore its HP. Mew uses Swift and that lowers all sorts of stats. And it's still a bit of a war of attrition, but you feel like you're actually getting somewhere because after sort of four or five sync moves, Heliolisk is putting out a, a lot of damage with Parabolic Charge. It's already mud slapped the other team into oblivion. Uh, Mew was getting a bit low on health towards the end, but there's nothing there that's going to heal Mew. The other two just do self-healing. And the two sides fainted because you're using moves that attack all three, so naturally they're going to go down at some point before you take out the Mizzle. You're going to be using Horn Leech and that's restoring uh, Xerneas' health. You can sink as well and that's going to restore some of its health. And I think by the end of it, I had used a grand total of seven sync moves. And finally, you're on to round four. The condition that comes with this one is a special attack boost. The enemy left was Grimsley. Grimsley was weak to fire. So for this one, I took in a team of Red and Charizards, Blaine and Rapidash, and Rosa and Siberia. Again, I went back to a sort of strength based strategy to get my 1500 points on this one. So my Rosa is raised to 6x and usually that would mean I would say you sink first with Rosa. But for this one it's a bit of overkill. Red and Charizard do enough damage that you don't really need an extra sink boost for them. And the first time I tried it I wasn't quite putting out enough damage with just normal Charizard and I, I didn't win the first time and I had to try it again. So yeah, it's likely to be a quick battle if you're following this strategy because Red is just going to be putting out loads of damage and the other team is going to be trying to hit you hard as well. But the strategy is Rosa raises the special attack of all pairs, Blaine sets trap on whoever's in the middle, but also sets the sun ready for Charizard sync moves. I think I might have actually forgotten to change the grid over to a solar grid, but it didn't cost me too much in the end. Red in the middle raises its stats with its trainer moves up until the sync move, and then you sync with it and you're using Blast Burn or Heat Wave. You're going to be doing a lot of damage with either of the two of them. If you don't manage to take Grimsley out before its sync move, then you're going to be in a bit of trouble because that sync move is hard. Every time I came up against it I only had two Pokemon left standing and it took out both of them, even if they both had full health, so be very wary of that if you're going with this strategy. So I did another run through with this one because I wanted to see how Leon fared against this one. And Leon did pretty good against this one too, so Inferno is a really good move, it sets Burning straight away. Your Sync move, even though I don't have him at 6x, it's very hard. I only needed to use one, and that pretty much took out the, the Sense Pokemon. I think it only lasted another couple of moves after that, and I was like, yeah, I could use my Sync move, or I could just Inferno, Inferno, and one-shot them. I also used Liza for this one instead of Rosa. I don't think I've used her in the Champion Stadium yet. So it's good to get a bit of variation in there. And finally, you come to Alder. For this week, they switched back to Alder instead of Champion Iris. I always thought it was a bit weird that we had two and it wasn't just the same one all the way through. But I'm glad it wasn't just Alder and then Iris for the rest of it that came back to him. And the condition for this one is you get a physical attack boost. I chose the optional condition of the sync move countdown as well. I went into this one with a team of Olivia and Lycanroc, Swanna and Skylar because I hadn't used them yet, and Delibird and Holiday Rosa. So as I mentioned last week, my strongest physical attacker is Olivia and Lycanroc. That goes quite well with the physical attack boost this week. Also plays in nicely with the fact that Alder this week was weak to rock types, so it was a no-brainer who was going to be my main striker for that. 
Rosa and Delibird have X-Attack all, which again boosts Lycanroc. All the presence is a bit of a wild card because it raises a random stat as well, and Skylar is just Skylar. So the strategy again, it's a strength based strategy, so it's do as much damage as quickly as possible and hope that you don't faint. Rosa raises attack, Skylar raises defense with take flight and then sinks first. After that, take flight if you've got more, gust if you need to, and then potions when you have to. Olivia does Heart of Diamonds to raise her accuracy and crit hit rate. Might need to use one of her attack boosts as well because you might only get two out of Rosa and Deli, Deli Bird. And then after that you're using Stone Edge and your Synchro. I actually checked my grid out afterwards and it turns out I had it set more towards a sort of sand build. So maybe if I was redoing it again I'd look at raising the damage from Stone Edge or making her more of a sink nuker. That's by the way. At some point in this battle, Alder is going to use Hyper Beam and it is going to mess you up. In fact, you're actually almost better off hoping he uses it early because then it's not going to do as much damage because he's not used his sync move yet and you've got the opportunity to heal from it. Once he's used his sync move, it's pretty much a one shot kill for anyone. But my sync move was pretty powerful by itself as well, so I went with the strategy of taking out the sides first and then hoping for a big sync move straight down the middle and drop a ton of rocks on that older guy. And again, it was a case of trying to output enough damage to make all three of the enemies faint before older took out his beam and turned it on me. And that's the Champion Stadium, 7,500 points for this week. Next week, we're moving on to a new region. I can't remember whether it's Kanto or Johto. If you've been playing for a while, you should have your medal for those two already, and you don't need to go through hard mode, you can just get straight into Master's mode. So as promised last week, we're now going to talk about the Legendary Arena, where we're taking on Tornadus this week. So Tornadus is weak to Electric-type Pokémon, and Paralysis has a very weird effect on him, so he will take more damage when he's paralysed than when he's not. So for round one I went in with a team of Heliolisk, Raichu and Volkner. The idea was Volkner sets electric terrain and boosts all of the electric damage going on. Heliolisk will maybe do some mud slaps to raise accuracy and then it's got its own sustain with parabolic charge. Raichu is your sort of sync nuker and main attacker. Volkner can also do flinch, but you only get, I think it's two flinches out of him, or maybe it's three. After the third one, it will get unflappable, which means you can't make it flinch anymore. But Thunderfang is still going to do a, a reasonable amount of damage after that, and you shouldn't need very long to take down this one as it's the easiest stage. For round two, I went with pretty much the same tactics and worked it out in pretty much the same way. I was a bit more wary of when I was setting electric terrain to line up with sync moves and also trying to line up my critical hits with Volkner as well. And finally, for round three, I'm going to say this at the start, the key here is paralysis. So you need someone on your team who can set paralysis, whether it's a passive from one of their moves or whether it's someone like uh, Togedimaru who has Nuzzle that causes just paralysis or, or someone who causes Sunspore. Sunspore. So the first time that I did it I went with the uh, tried and tested strategy on these legendary arenas of Mew and Viola to cause trap and lower the stats. I also took Skylar in there to tank as well. It didn't work as well as I was hoping for because after you've trapped Tornadus once it gets Escape Artist which means you can't trap it again so your trap damage isn't going to be that effective. And for this one really the stat lowering doesn't have a huge impact so you can probably just skip that stage. After those three had fainted I went back to my first team Heliolisk, Raichu and Luxray and Volkner. Same thing, Electric Terrain. Um, discharge, feel the Alolan Breeze with Raichu, and then Parabolic Charge, Mud Slap if you can, 
with Heliolisk. Uh, by this time though, Tornadus had kind of buffed itself, so it pretty much one-shotted Heliolisk. Uh, Raichu and Volkner were still able to do a fair amount of damage to it, but I did need to go onto a third set of Pokemon for this one. And that third team was Xerneas, the player with Pikachu, and then Elisa and Zeb Striker. And that managed to finish off the battle, obviously Xerneas does some tanking, the player in Pikachu is, is the healer of the team, even though it's a strike type, and Zeb Striker is your main attacker. So what I didn't gather until quite late into the battle was I wanted to be using Spark rather than the Mile Charge because Spark is the one that causes paralysis damage and that paralysis damage is the difference between a move doing say 500 and 2000 damage so you can see it's worth having. And for that one you've got some good synergy between Pikachu and Zeb Streaker because one does the healing the other one does the damage. You don't have that quite so much with Zebstreaker and Xerneas because Xerneas raises special attack whereas Zebstreaker is a physical attacker. I tried this a couple of more times, one time with Xerneas, Zebstreaker and Volkner and the other time with Xerneas, Raichu and Volkner. And the more I played it the more I was like right okay you do need to set paralysis because if you don't you're not doing nearly enough damage to take Tornadus out before it sort of tanks through and it just feels a lot better when you do a sync move and it does like 8000 damage rather than doing a sync move and it does 700 damage. So the battle villa reopens this week. For the early rounds you want to be using Pokemon that do moves that hit all of the opponents at once. You also want ones that do like self sustaining, so like Xerneas and Heliolisk. I'll go into more detail on that next week. One new feature is the overall level cap for all Pokemon has been increased from 130 to 135. That means that there are new items in the game and new ways to unlock them. I'm not all that fussed about raising pairs to 135. I've only got a few that are up to 130 at the moment, so I'm not too fussed about that, but I do like that you've got a new way of earning your um, of earning your tomes to level up to 130. That's more my goal than 135, is get everyone to 130. So I haven't worked it out yet whether it's worth doing the uh, tomes level 2 versus the level 1, so I'll, I'll get back to you on that one next week. But it feels like you do it a lot more quickly and then you get the codex and the higher level leveling up items as well while you're doing it. The Trial on the Isle event ends over this coming weekend so you want to be using up the last of your travel tokens and doing your daily battles until the end to see how many items you can pick up. It's been a good event though. I've been experimenting over the past week of putting Persian as my first Pokemon and it's had mixed results. When evasiveness kicks in that really helps. Some days I'm able to heal it, other days I'm not, but yeah, a little bit frustrating. And finally we've now got the time trial event. I've not explored this one extensively but the first thing I will say is that you don't need Rayhan to complete this event. He gives you He's the only one that gives you any kind of boost to your points, but there's enough days in there that if you get 2000 points off of each battle you do, you can make it to the end and get all the prizes without him. So I quite like that. I've been having some success with a team of Zacian, Delibird and Jasmine with Steelix. Um, if you don't have a steel type striker, so the likes of Steven or Solgaleo, what I've read somewhere is that the Pokemon on that battle are have very high physical defense. Their special defense is a bit lower, so if you've got a good special type striker, you might want to try going off type there. 
In fact, the quickest I've managed to do it was when I went in with a team based around Pidgeot, and I did that in just over two minutes. And at the end of the day, you're using a maximum of 60 stamina per day, so it's not like you're breaking the bank to do it. You've got the practice area, which is what I would recommend starting out on so that you can work out your strategy and make sure that you're getting it under three minutes. And that was the week that was. I hope you've all had a good week on Pokemon Masters X and that you've enjoyed the new events that are up and coming. So you're well past the 90 second mark at this point, so well done on making it this far. Since you've come this far, you've probably found something that you liked about this video, so why not subscribe to the channel and follow me on Twitter for details of next week, the week that was. For now, it's the week that will be. So I'll see you when it is the week it was. But thank you very much for watching this video, and goodbye.